Hello, my name is Christina Wiegand. I am South Atlantic Council staff and I will be presenting an overview of Spiny Lobster Amendment 13. First, I want to tell you guys a little bit about what scoping is. It's a part of the Council's FMP or plan amendment process. First, an issue or a management need is identified and then that need is taken out for scoping. And this is the first opportunity for the public to provide comments on ways to address that management need or issue. The council will then review that input and develop management actions and alternatives. After a document has been put together, that document will be approved and sent out for public hearings where again, the public has the opportunity to provide comment on the management actions and alternatives after which the council will review that comment, those comments, make any modifications they deem necessary, at which point they will give it final approval, and at that council meeting will be the last chance for public input. And so right now we're still at scoping, which is the first and best opportunity to make suggestions for the council to consider before an amendment has been completely developed. Right now, Spiny Lobster Amendment 13 contains two actions, and the first action looks at bully netting. And a bully net is a type of gear that's used to harvest spiny lobster, and it generally consists of a mesh net which, with a long handle, and we've seen a steady increase in participation in the bully net fishery. And constituents in Florida had expressed concerns to Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, or FWC, about that increased participation, as well as growing conflict between recreational bully netters and commercial bully netters and other members of the public, such as homeowners. So as a result of that, and based on a lot of stakeholder input, FWC approved a set of regulations that looked at helping quantify participation in the commercial bully net fishery, as well as continuing to allow entry into the fishery and addressing other stakeholder concerns. And four key new regulations have been implemented related to bully nets in Florida state waters. The first is the creation of a bully net endorsement that is required in conjunction with the harvester's saltwater product license, as well as the restricted species and crawfish endorsements. Additionally, the definition of commercial harvester was updated to include that bully net endorsement. Vessels are required to be marked with reflective paint with their bully net number, and trap pullers are prohibited aboard commercial bully net vessels. And finally, the new regulations prohibit the simultaneous possession of bully nets and any underwater breathing apparatus. So the first action in this amendment addresses those new bully net regulations. Alternative one would be the no action alternative, so that there would be no new bully net regulations established in federal waters, whereas alternative two just establishes those same Florida regulations in the EEZ off of Florida. And the council believes it's important to create consistency between state and Florida regulations and regulations in the EEZ off of Florida, but would welcome your input. The second action in this amendment addresses the enhanced cooperative management system. And so this system was originally set up back in amendment two, and it allowed the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to propose Florida regulations for implementation in the EEZ directly to the National Marine Fisheries Service. And the goal of this was to create a more timely regulatory mechanism that would allow for better state and federal coordination. However, in Amendment 10, the procedure that goes with that management protocol was inadvertently removed. And so until it's reestablished, in order to extend Florida regulations into the EEZ, the council will have to go through a full amendment process. And so here is action two addressing that cooperative management procedure. That alternative one is the no action. So the council will have to go through the full amendment process anytime they want to change regulations in the EEZ off Florida to be consistent with Florida state regulations. Alternative two would reestablish that procedure, allowing Florida to submit rules directly to the National Marine Fishery Service without having to go through that full council amendment process. And the council believes this will create a much timelier way to create consistency between state and federal regulations, but again, would welcome any input you have. At their most recent council meetings, the Gulf and South Atlantic councils were presented with a list of inconsistent regulations between state of Florida waters and federal waters. Some of these regulations are simple in nature. They involve changes such as 
phone numbers or spelling errors, updating references to the Florida regulations, and don't involve any substantial changes. And as such, they can simply be updated without council action next time the spiny lobster regulations are updated. However, there are three items that would require formal council action to be updated, and those are bag limits aboard, commercial bully netters and divers, degradable panels and traps, and the definition of artificial habitat. Currently in federal waters, there is no commercial daily vessel harvest or possession limit for spiny lobster that are harvested by bully nets or by diving. However, in Florida waters, spiny lobster that are harvested by bully nets have a harvest and possession limit of 250 lobsters per day throughout the state of Florida. Divers have a limit of 250 spiny lobster per day in waters off of Broward, Dade, Monroe, Collier, and Lee counties. And it's important to note that Florida commercial spiny lobster, bully net, and dive fishermen are restricted to this limit regardless of whether they're fishing in state or federal waters as a condition of their state permit and license requirements. There are a number of differences in state of Florida regulations and federal regulations for degradable panels. In federal waters, traps must be constructed of wood, cotton, or any material that's going to degrade at the same rate as a wooden trap. However, in Florida waters, traps must be con degradable panels must be constructed of cypress or untreated pine slats that are no thicker than three fourths of an inch. In federal waters, when removed, that degradable panel must create an opening in the trap that's no smaller than the diameter found at the throat or entrance of the trap. However, in Florida waters, that degradable panel must be no smaller than six inches by four inches or no smaller than the dimensions of the throat or entrance of the trap, whichever of those two is larger. Finally, in federal waters, the degradable panel must be located in the upper half of the sides or on top of the trap, whereas in Florida waters, that degradable panel must be located on the top horizontal section of the trap. And last but not least, currently in federal waters, we do not define artificial habitat for spiny lobster, and there are no restrictions for the harvest or possession of spiny lobster on a artificial habitat. However, the state of Florida defines an artificial habitat as any material placed in the water that is reasonably suited to providing cover or habitat for spiny lobster. And this can be constructed of wood, metal, fiberglass, concrete, or plastic, or any combination thereof, and doesn't necessarily have to be fabricated for the specific purpose of being artificial habitat. Additionally, they prohibit harvest of spiny lobster from any artificial habitat, as well as restricting the harvest and possession of spiny lobster to the recreational bag limit within 10 yards of any artificial habitat. Now, the council again believes that it's important to have consistency between federal and state regulations in Florida, and would like your opinion on whether or not bag limits, degradable panels, and artificial habitat should be addressed in Amendment 13, or if there are any other issues that might be ideally addressed in Amendment 13. Here you can see the proposed timing for Spiny Lobster Amendment 13. We're currently undergoing amendment scoping, after which the South Atlantic Council will review scoping comments as well as an updated draft options paper and approve actions and alternatives to be analyzed. Staff will then analyze those actions and alternatives and present them to the Gulf and South Atlantic Council they will review the document and approve it for public hearings. Those public hearings will be head, held tentatively around July 2018, after which both councils will review the public input and take final action on the amendment. And we'd be tentatively looking at implementation of that amendment in early 2019. There are a couple of different ways you can submit comments on Spiny Lobster Amendment 13. We will be holding scoping webinars January 8th and January 9th of 2018, both starting at 6 p.m. Registration for those scoping webinars is required, and you can register by clicking on the links below. And those webinars will include a staff presentation in addition to a question and answer session followed by an opportunity to provide your comments on the record. If you are unable to attend the scoping webinars, you can also submit your comments in writing via our public comment form, and the link for that is below. 
And the deadline for comments to be included in the overview for the March 2018 meeting is 5 p.m. on February 9th of 2018. If you want to stay connected with the South Atlantic Council and stay informed on a variety of issues, you can check out our website as well as our Facebook and Twitter account. Finally, if there's anything that we didn't cover or you have more questions, feel free to contact us. You can, if you have questions about Spiny Lobster, you're welcome to contact myself at the phone and email address provided there. Or if you have general questions about the South Atlantic Council, please feel free to contact Cameron Rhodes, our fishery outreach specialist, or Kim Iverson, our public information officer.